This is chapter four. It's all about linear regressions. So I think are both of you, have both of you worked with linear regressions before? Yeah, I, 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 I did. Yeah. So like, I don't think it will be something very new, but it's still good to just go through. Yeah, it's still good to just have a, a recap, yeah. So um, regressions are when you want to model the relationship between a dependent variable y and one or more explanatory variables denoted as usually x1, x2, and so on for however many you have. And you could use a regression to model how reducing school staffing uh, corresponds with reducing test scores or how would increasing coffee consumption increase blood pressure or really whatever you wanna model, almost anything you can do. And so if we look at the MT cars data set, um, I did DV, I didn't use the same data set as the book. Um, it just, I didn't want to rehash everything the exact same way and MT cars is easy. But if we wanted to see how miles per gallon and horsepower are related, is there an increase? If there's an increase in horsepower, does that mean that there's a decrease in miles per gallon? with the thinking being that the higher horsepower vehicles are using more fuel. And so we have, we can plot a line, or if we plot all the points with horsepower on the x-axis and then miles per gallon on the y, and then I'm manually creating a line here, just sort of like guessing, trying to figure out what's the closest to all of the points. And we can do that with this intercept and picking a slope. But it doesn't hit all of the points. And how do we know that this line I drew is right? Like, how, how close is it to the truth? And so we have to consider if there are other factors that might influence gas mileage. And we could write our model as miles per gallon is equal to beta zero. So that would be the intercept plus beta one horsepower, where beta is the coefficient, plus the beta and any other factors. And then if we were to generalize this, it would be yi equals beta zero plus beta one xi plus ui. And then that's our intercept slope essentially for a single linear regression and then any error term we have. And so I guess I got a little ahead of myself, but i is the index for each observation, y i is the dependent variable, which is also known as the regressand, x i is the independent variable, the regressor, and beta zero is the intercept of the regression line and beta one is the slope and ui is the error term. And the error term should be constant relatively, or sorry, it should be like, actually the exact opposite of constant. It should be totally random, but it should be constantly random. But anyways, so the ordinary least squares estimator is a good way of measuring how close your line is to the actual data. And we choose coefficients to try and get the regression line as close as possible. And closest is the sum of squared mistakes in y predicted given x. And so we have a bunch of lovely equations here for OLS, which is the sum starting at one all the way up to n, yi minus b0 minus b1 x1 squared. And then the estimators for the slope and intercept are given as these values, these equations, which we'll go into a bit more in a second, but we have our current value 
and then anything with the bar is the mean. So it'd be minus the x mean, and then we have yi minus y mean, and then all over xi minus x bar squared. And then our beta zero would be y hat, sorry, y bar minus beta one hat times x bar. And then we have more equations for the predicted values and residuals as well. Where we have y hat equals beta zero hat plus beta one hat x and u hat is equal to y minus y hat. And it's not super important to know these if you're doing modeling on the computer because you don't have to calculate it by hand, but it's still good to know how the values are found just to keep it like in the back of your mind. And so if we wanted to estimate these values in R, just to make things easier, I'm going to create miles per gallon and horsepower from MT cars. Um, in the book, he's still using attach which is a, it's being phased out in R, like people aren't using attach as much just because it can get kind of confusing as to what exactly you're referencing. But if we look here, we can see we have our X variable, our independent variable, the horsepower minus the mean horsepower times our dependent variable miles per gallon minus mean miles per gallon. That's divided by the sum of horsepower minus mean horsepower squared. And if we go back, we can see that that is this equation here. And so if we do the same for uh, beta zero, we have mean miles per gallon minus beta one times mean horsepower. And again, we can double check. And that's what we have there. And then our beta one is negative 0.068 and beta zero is 30.09. And if you remember my values from before, I had estimated beta zero was 33 and beta one was negative 0.07. So I got the slope pretty close, but the beta zero, I was a little off. And so if we were to try and model with LM, which produces a linear regression in R, where you have the dependent variable, a tilde, and then any of your independent variables, if I were to print that, then I get this little thing that shows me my coefficients. And we have the same intercept and slope, the coefficient for horsepower, as our previous manually calculated slides. And if we were to replace our previous line with this regression line, um, I hid the code, but because I did a pretty good job guessing, I was pretty close. But if we were to go back, my line is a little bit steeper and I miss a lot of these middle points. And so now the line is a little lower and we're getting, we're going through more of them, which is pretty good. And so we have, we have to figure out how good our model actually is and how do we measure that? And so we have the coefficient of determination, which is also known as the R squared. And it's the fraction of the sample variance of YI that is explained by XI and is the ratio of the explained sum of squares to the total sum of squares. Um, another way I've seen it sort of described is how much of your model is actually explained, how much of your results is actually explained by your model compared to all of the variation in the final result. So like if my model has an R squared of 80.85, it means I can only explain 85% of the variation in the final product. So R squared, um, just to make it a little simpler, 
rather than listing out a bunch of equations, I did some I did some things like this, which just means this is the sum of squared residuals, which is equal to this. So, but we have the R squared is equal to one minus the sum of squared residuals over the total sum of squared, total sum of squares, where sum of squared residuals is the error, the sum of error squareds. And then we have, sorry, I'm forgetting, estimated sum of squares, which is yi minus y bar, y, sorry, y hat i minus y bar squared. And the total sum of squares is the regular yi minus y bar squared. And your r squared should always be between zero and one, where one is a like perfect, you can explain everything. And then zero is you can't explain anything. And a threshold value for good r squared, it's really dependent on what you're doing. Like in my econ courses, we talked about predicting like stock markets or like whatever. So like if, if you're trying to predict the stock market and you could had an R squared of like 0.2, you'd be doing pretty good. Like that would be phenomenal. Whereas if I'm trying to predict empty cars, then I might want something a little higher. Or like at work on yesterday, um, my boss sent out a little challenge to everyone and I was pretty happy with like a 0.7 R squared just for a simple model with not a lot of data that like it was good enough, but it really depends on what you're doing. And it's the kind of thing where you might be able to put in, it's like diminishing returns where you can put in a little bit of work and get an okay result, but as you try and get a better and better model, it's gonna take exponentially more time. So we have the standard error of the regression as well, which estimates the standard deviation of the residuals and is given by this equation. Um, I didn't go into this one as much, just because I, I don't know. But we have standard error of the regression is equal to s u hat, which is equal to the square root of s u hat squared. And I'm not really, I guess this kind of makes sense if this is this, you square something and then take the square root. But um, that's it ends up expanding out to all of this, which is the sum of squared residuals over n minus two, where n is the number of um, observations you have. And so if we wanted to check our measures of fit in R, we can call summary on the model we made earlier, which is we called linear year model. And then we have this whole big output. And a few things to see, we have our adjusted R squared, which comes out to 0.5892. So about 58.9% of the variance in miles per gallon can be explained by the horsepower. We have our, let's see. It. Our residual standard error here. And then we have our multiple R squared here. And so multiple R squared is sort of like the raw value. And then adjusted R squared will adjust for the number of variables you use. And so it tends to be a little bit lower. And then we have our p values here as well. And um, it's very helpful because it'll tell you what the asterisks mean and their significant codes. Mm. 
And so a pretty good one to start with is 0 0.05, but there's no sort of like guarantee that 0.5 is like the end all be all of benchmarks. If you're doing something that needs to be very accurate, you might want to use a lower significant code. And so if we were to try and calculate these values in R, we can take our summary and our residuals and we want to sum the squared of our residuals. And then if we wanted the um, totals, we could do our miles per gallon minus mean miles per gallon squared and sum that as well. And then our R squared is one minus SSR over TSS. And we can see that our R squared now has a value of 0 0.6024, which matches the calculated value here. And we can also do the same thing for our residual standard error. And if we take the square root of SSR divided by the number of rows, so that's our um, our population amount minus two, and then we have our residual standard error. And you will notice that we have 32 observations minus two, and that's the same number as our degrees of freedom. And Abdu, yeah, I think usually I try and aim for like 0.6 to 0.7 at least, but there comes a point where like, you could add a bunch of random variables that don't really, on their own, they don't mean much, but they add like a tiny like 0 0.05 to your R squared. So if you add enough of them, then it will be a lot higher. But the limit I always learned in school, rather than like, rather than just aiming for the highest R squared was what's the highest R squared you can get but also being able to explain all of your independent variables. So like if I was trying to model miles per gallon and I added a variable for like car color, like sure car color might correlate a little bit to gas mileage, but how would I explain that? Like if someone was like, hey, how do you like explain this? Like I, I could try saying maybe people in red cars drive faster and so they get lower miles per gallon, but like it, there's nothing really to back that up. And so if we go to, so in order to actually like model something, we need to make sure we have a few assumptions first. And so the error term has to have a conditional mean of zero, which means that errors must be truly random. If our error term is always a little bit positive, then that means there's something wrong with the data because a true error should always be random and should always converge to zero. We must have independently and identically distributed data. And so, if we have predictors with high correlation, that can cause model problems because then instead of seeing the results of just one variable, you're seeing the two of them together. And then, oops, I have a typo. This is supposed to, but uh, time series data does not meet this assumption because your present data is dependent on your past data. And so it's not truly independent. And then you also need to make sure that large outliers are unlikely. And so if we go back to empty cars and modeling the gas mileage, if we're looking at, let's go all the way back. If we're looking at this chart and I have one car that has like 70 miles per gallon. And so the point would be like way up here by the dot on the eye. Then our line is going to change from here, I think I can, no, okay. But if my dot was up here, then my line might look a little bit steeper. 
because it would get pulled off course by the outlier. And so if we go back. Um, so yeah, large outliers, but really at any point, some outliers are okay and to be expected. But if you have a bunch of large outliers, then it, it can get a little messy and you might need to check your data collection or maybe you have a prior data processing step that's messing something up. And so we have, the book has some neat little like interactive things for the sampling distribution, which are, I didn't think I could do any better. So um, we have the sampling distribution of the OLS estimator. And because beta zero and beta one hat are computed from a sample, the estimators themselves are random variables with a probability distribution. And so if we were to try and write this out as an equation, the estimate of beta zero hat is beta zero and the estimate of beta one hat is beta one. And that they're unbiased estimators, which are the true parameters. If a sample is sufficiently large, then the central limit theorem says that they should all converge on the appropriate values. And the central limit theorem is essentially if you have enough data, then your estimated values, your computed values will converge on sort of like the true value. And so we have, there's this neat little um, graphic here, which shows your um, histogram increasing or I guess getting your number of data points getting larger. And then you can see the plot changing and the lines converging on each other as the population grows. So I, I'm gonna turn this down a little bit so it goes faster, but And so you can slowly see the, uh, the white line converging on the red line. But reset that so it's not freaking out. Um, he has some simulation studies as well, which again, there wasn't really any point in me redoing everything in R. And so if we were to build a population of 100,000 observations in total, what sort of could we model? And so if we generate numbers from a random sample in zero to 20, calculate all the error terms and everything else, then um, we can manually set a beta zero and beta one that would follow this equation. And so in order to do that, we set our population size n to 100,000. We can do a uniform distribution of 100,000 items with a minimum and maximum value of 20 and assign that to x. And our u value can be a normal distribution because we need it to converge on zero of 100,000 items with a standard deviation of 10. And so then we can assign our population regression manually to negative two plus 3.5 times X plus U, and then create a data frame of X and Y. And so uh, if you guys want to stop at any point and see what this looks like, I have an R window open, ready to go. Um, so for now, we can consider this as the true, the true data. And so if we sample 100 items, we can compute our variance of beta hat zero. And then 
compute the variance of beta hat one, again, using the same equations we had used before. And print, we can print these variables to the console. And so here it looks like our beta zero might be a little bit different. Same with our beta one from what we had manually chosen. But if we were to keep doing this again and do it, we wanted a sample size of 100 and we wanted 10,000 repetitions. We can make a giant matrix that represents all of the outcomes. And then for each item in the replications, we can sample our population and then model our Y and X values with the sample. And then we're just assigning our row in the matrix to our coefficient values. And we can compute the variance estimates using the outcomes. And so we get uh, 4.18 and 0.03, which are pretty close to, sorry, I forgot these were the variance, my bad. But it comes up pretty close to our single sample. And so if we divide the plotting area as a one by two, so we'll have some side by side plots, we can add some histograms and then uh, curve lines to represent the normal distribution. And we can see our distribution of beta zero and beta one estimates. And then this again goes back to that simulation at the top where over time, as you add more values, the central limit theorem dictates that you'll find sort of a true value in the middle. And then there's another sim uh, simulation where we have a thousand repetitions with different sample sizes. And then we're performing similar steps and this time plotting density. And we can see that for beta one, as n increases, the distribution of beta one concentrates around the mean. And as such, its variance decreases. And so put differently, the likelihood of observing estimates close to the true value of beta one three equals 3.5 grows as we increase the sample size. The same behavior can be observed if we analyze the distribution of beta zero instead. And so again, it's more of the central limit theorem. The larger your data set, the less variance you'll see, and the closer to a true value you get. Um, simulation three, I was working on this last night, and the math was a little bit too much for my brain at the moment. But um, if we take a look together, 4.1 shows that the variance of the OLS estimator for beta one decreases as the variance of XI increases, which is good. We can visualize this by reproducing figure 4.6 and we sample observations XI, YI from a bivariate normal distribution with this, whoops. And formally this is written down this way, which I don't, my, ability to read math equations is not spectacular, but um, to carry out random sampling, we can use this function MVR norm from the mass package. And mass is a, it's something you use a lot when you're learning about regressions. And then there's also a bunch of helpful functions in there, which allows us to draw random samples from multivariate normal distributions. Next, we can use subset to split the data into two subsets so that we have the first set fulfilling absolute value of x minus x bar is greater than one. And the second set would inc include the rest of the data. And so that, I think, again, nowadays people would use filter from dplyr instead of subset, but there's nothing saying you can't use subset or a different way of writing it all together. Um, and so if we plot that, then we have these blue points in the middle from set two, 
where the black points are from set one. And so the black ones are the ones where um, x minus x bar is greater than one. And it's, we can see that the observations are close to the sample average of xi and have less variance than those that are farther away. And so if we were to try and draw a line through either of the two sets, then we want to use the set of observations that has a larger variance than the blue ones, which would re result in a more precise line. And so we can run a regression on set one and set two separately, and then plot the points and the lines together, where set one is the green line and set two is the red line. And we can see that the red line is very far off from what appears to be sort of the true distribution of the data. And so that's, I believe that's the end of the chapter. There are some exercises we could do but um, I'm not sure if you want to, or if you want to go over anything else. Um, yeah, we, we still have time. Maybe we could uh, go through one or two of the exercises. No. If you are fine with that. Yeah, no, I've got time. Yeah. All right. Um, Maybe I think that rather than the focusing on the exercise, maybe yeah. I just want to understand uh, what we uh, just show uh, wrong things. Because, uh, for example, when you go go up a little bit, like a resampling yeah. kind of process, mm -hmm. when you yeah, when you scroll down, like a simulation studies. That yeah. is actually what we call like a kind of like a kind of like a sampling method, right? Because because mm -hmm. uh, uh, maybe for example, maybe I just kind of testing. Do you guys see my writing? Um. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. For example, when we have a ten thousand, ten thousand sample as a sample size, there is actually multiple way to sampling method right maybe mm -hmm. if we can make a decide to okay let me try to try to make a one two three and five and then maybe the last one gonna be the, our test test the data set and then uh, these are the maybe the, our training data set these are the kind of like, uh, what the sampling is about because in here actually they actually using the all of the sample as a kind of a training things, but if these are actually kind of a shows us some kind of a process of the sampling, sampling uh, random sampling from the our yeah. data, and then try to testing the possible slope, like a like a range of the slope, and and y intercept, which is the beta uh, beta zero and beta one, and then uh. Actually, in the two, two, uh, two parameter, uh, or one, I think a two parameter model like this. In this case, we actually have uh, this kind of a three dimensional kind of a spaces with a uh, with a uh, kind of like a very with a one single pit for the our best pit for the precision uh, precisions. So. These are the actually what the, these simulation study does is what I think is uh, it just kind of literally shows a uh, kind of a uh, okay for example like uh, we can we can also using the these kind of a sampling approaches we can try to do the what is called uh, what's the most most precision model possible model would be in terms of the, some kind of a predictive purposes mm -hmm. and also. I personally think that uh, when we looking at the U uh, UI, like a like a error term, sometimes we usually say about the epsilon i as an error term. This is actually kind of very important because 
we actually want this one as a kind of a very random like this which is a zero is the at the center so that means it all of the sum of the error term some of the error term should be zero but the thing is when we try to plot the, these kind of error term error error term of the each observation did we actually in the linear regression we actually assume that this error term should be the random and then and then when we looking at the when we looking at the sum of the error terms uh, square this one should be maybe must definitely must be the positive number so this is actually what is called a standard error and then when we when we divide the coefficients by by the standard error this actually gives us what is called the t score in the r and then we can test this one actually using the this t score we can actually try to use the p value and then when we looking at the that summary result we also see the what is called the app statistics because the app statistic is a kind of like a value itself is a, what is called the chi square value right mm -hmm. on the dependent depend on the freedom actually app statistic might not be very meaningful when we actually learn the only one model it also has a meaning if if for the if a single model when we learn only learn the single model but app statistic actually very useful when we have a two deep maybe two or three different model, which is the very good bit to our, um, our uh, research purposes. But the thing is, we have to know about the which one gonna be much better, you know, among the, these two or three model, we have to choose one, right? In that case, we can actually use what is called the ANOVA function, like a fit, one and feed two. In in when we use the, this ANOVA function, actually app statistic gonna be used like a difference to the chi square and then degree of the freedom for what and then uh, which one is the more fit, more shows the goodness of fit. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Like. I don't know. I, yeah, because of what I wanted to learn is uh, in from here, actually, I just wanted to understand the exact principle and mechanism behind the linear regression or whatever. So that's okay. what I actually know about yeah. The, yeah, some mathematical about the linear regression. So no, yeah, just things about the, yes. I, I think it's funny because like, you learn about linear, like for me, at least I learned about linear regression in school, like four times, uh -huh. but every time they go over the same parts that the book does, uh -huh. and then they get a little bit deeper into the math. Uh, so like, once you get like the stuff you were doing was like a lot, I wouldn't necessarily, it's a lot farther in, but uh -huh. it's more like taking mm. more time to look at each of the different components. Yeah. rather than just saying hey this is what this value is and this is how you calculate it yeah so but yeah it's oh. uh -huh. like you can sort of see um i i was trying to find some of my old notes to show mm -hmm. but where you like plot out the error for each point mm -hmm. and then you can draw the um the line of best fit through them and see how the, the line goes through. And I guess it would be basically if you were in like Excel or Google Sheets. Uh, yeah, and, you, yeah. Uh, you mean the QQ plot, right? No, the, um, if you just turn on the error bars uh, uh -huh. on, your, on your points. So hang on, actually I have, I have some good data. So every time I put gas in my car, Mm. I fill out a Google form mm. that I put in how many gallons I put in, the price, mm. if my light was on, mm. uh, what my like 
gas gauge said, and then I've been trying to mm. plot out, um, here we go. So mm. the, the fuel tank gauge isn't the most accurate thing. Mm. So if the, if my gauge says I have like one out of four, mm. am I actually at a quarter tank? And so I started plotting it out. And if we look, I'm going to edit the chart a little bit and we can mess around with it. And so this would be like a standard linear regression. And then if I look mm -hmm. here, mm. we turn off data labels, but I can turn on the error bars. Mm -hmm. And now we can see that our yeah, trend right. line flows through yeah. most of the points error bars. Yeah. And this is a little different because my x-axis isn't fully continuous. Yeah. It's, I've rounded it to like the nearest quarter. Yeah, actually, when you just look, when you just looking or focusing on the just kind of a point by itself, mm -hmm. like uh, it is like uh, for the from the uh, frequentist perspectives, it just kind of a give us kind of a, okay, what's the better predictive for the outcome? But yeah. like a like a Bayesian perspective, you mm -hmm. maybe you can kind of a draw kind of a like this, maybe like a, like a range. Yeah, you know, range of the range of the curve area, which is the, which is the how, how, what's the, uh, my, my credibility, credibility mm -hmm. level of the model would be depending on my observations. And also I think that this one, this data set, what I think is, uh, this one is actually time series data set, right? You actually recording over so time, right? This, yeah. Not so, so like I'm, re yeah. I'm recording yeah. over time, but my yeah. gas mileage on any uh, one trip between gas stations is independent of the previous one. Yeah, right, correct. So like, so, yeah, it's I, if I wanted to model some things over time, mm -hmm. I could. So like, I think my gas mileage has generally gotten worse over time. My car is very old, mm -hmm. and so like my average from the first five months I had it roughly was mm. 23.5. But I mm. think lately I've my job, I have to drive on the highway to get there. Mm -hmm. And so if we go back a few yeah. months, it's I've lost mm. like 1.2 miles per gallon on average. It's like yeah. that I might model as time series data. And yeah. I think I have a chart. Yeah, this one just shows yeah. my like each, yeah. each point is a time I put gas in the car. Mm. And um, this is sort of like the closest I have to mm. time series data. Mm. Yeah, maybe, maybe for example, for your time series data set, maybe if you can test what is called the Dublin, Dublin Watson test, like a DW test, yeah. maybe you will find that there is a highly autocorrelate among uh, across the observations and then uh, maybe in that case maybe you can try a different way to do mm -hmm. that like uh, how how maybe over time the kind of a changing in the gas tank as a response yeah. what's the factor that affects to the that changes over time and then yeah, that might be another question but yeah so because in, in your presentation slide, you said that time series data set does not, does not meet the assumption of the linear equation, which is correct yeah. because between the observations, time series data set actually have a highly correlated to the one another because when, when yeah. the observation is too close in time, in terms of the time. So in that case, time series data set does not meet the assumption and then we have to do the different way it is also the same thing when we have a special data set because a special data set also have the, does not meet the, this kind of assumption mm -hmm. because of the neighboring effect. Because uh, like, for example, high crime in the neighbor A tends to, uh, uh, can be affect to the, the uh, risk of the crime of the neighbor B, neighbor B, which is the adjacent to the neighbor A. So. That means the time series data set, uh, special data set doesn't meet this assumption, but 
But anyway, so that's the kind of thing. And then the other thing is that you also said the predictor with a higher correlation can cause the model problem, which means it, it just kind of, this one actually mentions about the, what is called multi corollary is that correct? Yeah. So, yeah, this one is also multi corollary at the same time, the, what is called the heterogeneity kind mm -hmm. of a problem. Because uh, when we have a, uh, when we have a, uh, the last time when, when I show the correlation scatter plot, when we have uh, some scatter plot actually shows the, some kind of a specific fan in or fan out patterns, then might be have a heterogeneity problem, which means that there is a more external factor that affects to the independent and outcome variable, both, which is the we need to con add the more confounding variable to our model to increase our goodness of fit. And then, and then that's the kind of uh, things, this one. And then uh, error time has a condition mean of the zero to render. Yeah, yeah, so that's the thing. So, and then, so, so we also, because in, in this book, does, this book does not explain the, about the, how we can identify the, identifying the, what, which one is the uh, correlated to one another, like a multi-correlated test. Not, we, not we, here. Uh, is the think, chapter five? I think chapter six with multiple uh, regressors. Uh, if we take uh, a okay. look. It might have it. Mm, yeah, 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 right. Oh, that's okay. Neat. Yeah, because uh, that one is actually what I talk about. Because uh, yeah, yeah, when we have a uh, when we have a x and y variable as a two two parameters, we can get the, those kind uh, of a three dimensional. Go. Yeah, yeah, multi Yes, yeah. Yeah. Ah, uh, okay. So yeah, that me. Yeah, we can. We can study that one maybe later on. So yeah, yeah. no, it's yeah. multicollinearity is something good to be aware of because it can even be something that's non-obvious. Uh, or like there are some that yeah. if you just like think about it, it might make mm. more sense. Like with empty cars, mm -hmm. if we go, I, mean, I might whoever's watching this later might go, ah, this guy knows nothing about cars. But mm -hmm. like the displacement mm -hmm. probably generally correlates to the number of cylinders. Mm. And so yeah. like that's something, I mean, you have a larger engine, you're likely, mm. I think, to have larger displacement. Mm. It's not something you would necessarily think about right away. Yeah. Actually, what but, is the interesting for me in here when you're looking at the, this data set? Mm -hmm. I just kind of wondering, maybe for example, when we looking at the Mazda RX4, yeah, and Mazda RX4 wagon, mm -hmm. okay. Actually, these are almost the same kind of yeah. uh, speculations. Yep. So that means maybe their MPG and then uh, their horsepower is exactly the same, which means which means uh, maybe. What I what I just kind of wondering is maybe for example when we have a maybe what is called a sonata, I because I I I know the yeah the Korean company so maybe con sonata two thousand thirteen and then a two thousand maybe fifteen or two thousand maybe twenty one yeah do you think it might be the very high tends to be highly co auto correlated to each other in terms of the observation. I don't know, because uh, yeah, that's what I thought. Because uh, for example, this one is actually very similar. And then uh, that means maybe this observation actually tends to be very highly correlated to each other. Yeah. Is that uh, possible to do that? In that case, maybe is that OK to say this this table, this data set does not have, does not violate the, our, our, the, the linear regression assumptions. Yeah, I'm kind of wondering, cause uh, these are the, almost the same model, you know? Yeah. But the thing is, 
we actually also in the linear regression, we actually assume that there is a no auto correlation effect among the across the observations, right? So that means yeah. one one car observation does not affect to the observation of the, the other cars, right? I think it yeah. would be okay. Yeah. And the reason I'm gonna say that is yeah. there like I I know a little bit about cars, I don't know a lot, but I do know that some manufacturers will use the same engine or mm -hmm. even like the same frame mm -hmm. in multiple vehicles. Mm -hmm. And so like here, the wagon is slightly yeah. heavier. Yeah, so right. So if I remodeled with horsepower and weight, mm -hmm. then it would give me, I, yeah. I think they're sufficiently different. Yeah. Rather, uh, then, if they were identical, yeah. then even then, if every data point was the same, so long as they are actually two different cars, mm -hmm. then I guess that would sort of lend credence to, to my data and saying, okay, this is, I now have more data points. They are different, mm -hmm. even though they're producing the same value. So in that case, we can say that in the in here, when you're looking at these kind of a little conceptual diagram, yeah. Because uh, in our in your question is the horsepower actually have uh, associated with the MBG, right? Yeah. But the thing is, just kind of uh, using the horsepower as a predictor for the MBG does not mm -hmm. good enough because, yeah. as you can see, these two Mazda example. There is a one variable called the weight variable, which yeah. is the effects to the horsepower, horsepower and MPG, which means that this one is a confounding variable. Mm -hmm. you know? So that means in our in our case, when we learn uh, the, the model that we ran uh, looked at throughout our study today, the, we actually might say that just using the HP and MPG for our model does not good enough and then does not show us the good result, which is that there is a actually external factor for the weight. Yeah. Which means we have to consider these kind of things into our model. That means we gonna be, our model gonna be more complicated. But because of the, 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 what I wanted to say is, uh, Whenever we try to looking at our regression or all different kinds of model, we always have to check about the, is there still any kind of factors that that we did not consider, mm -hmm. but might be affected to our outcome. So, yeah. but sometimes it is almost impossible to consider those kind of variables due to the our sample size problem, or maybe we don't have any data set for that. Mm -hmm. Maybe in that case, we actually in academic studies, like a journal publication, we just say, okay, these are, these are the kind of limitations of this model or this study. And then uh, maybe when we have uh, this data set, maybe we can do the more good model. That's yeah. how we approach it. Yeah, but I'm not sure about the, what, the, what, what the practical level or company usually do when, have uh, those kind of a problem, but yeah. I, yeah. So I think, yeah, like so much of statistics mm. is like concrete math, but then so much of doing statistics well is knowing your environment and your data and making the best decisions you can based off of that information. Yeah, right. So like when sometimes people in the Slack will be like, oh, like what's the best way to do this? And it's like, mm -hmm. well, it it depends. Yeah, it depends, it, yeah. It's the kind of, you can't just like teach it because it's something you have to sort of like learn through trial and error. Mm. Yeah. But, yeah, but sometimes the trial error actually help us to develop our model further. But yeah. the thing is, there is actually more fundamental for a problem. Like uh, we don't have any data set that, mm -hmm. relate, that we think it is significantly associated with our outcome variable. 
But the thing is, if we don't have a data set, what are we going to do? Sometimes we actually have a, that kind of a dilemma in both academic and practical levels. So, so that's the kind of uh, things. Maybe there is uh, some ways we can actually uh, go around or go through that kind of problem. Maybe sometimes we can change in our modeling approaches to get more better result. Or sometimes maybe the only the best the best thing we can do is to get the data. But sometimes getting that data costs a lot of money or a lot of time or a lot of efforts. So so we what I wanted to say is when we try to modeling something, maybe we have to clearly understand about the, what the, our possible potential limitation would be. So, yeah. so that's the kind of uh, my perspective. So it's yeah. all good points, and I appreciate you adding so much for everything today. Uh, because I I mostly just went off the book, but uh, like you said, there's so much more to it than yeah. Well, so that's the that's the what we actually read in the book because to understand yeah. understand the something behind the behind the book. So, yeah. Yeah, because I think that I can say these kind of things because actually I personally took the econometrics classes at the when mm -hmm. I was a doctoral student. So, okay. uh, so that's the reason why I can say this kind of stuff because I actually this one is actually what I heard from my professors, my teachers. Yeah. And then, and then but the thing is, uh, still, yeah, uh, there is a, a lot of things to be considered when we try to model it. So that actually sometimes that, uh, sometimes makes me feel hesitant to develop the model first without without exploring the our observation or my data set uh, until I fully understand the data set itself. So, so that's the kind of a problem. But the thing is in the practical level, there is also time constraint or time limitations, right? So we cannot spend all my all most of our time to just exploring the data set. So, so we have to make a try to make a balance about the, how we can explore the data set and then based on the that explorations and then how we can develop the model. So always time kind of a constraint is <laughs> mm -hmm. kind of a big big factor that affects to our development about the model. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, I just saying yeah. so you, that you, things for the yeah. I think we're pretty much out of time. Yeah. So, thank you both. And I don't know. Oh shoot, I don't think anyone has signed up for next week. Okay, so next week is the chapter five, right? Yeah. You. Yeah. Oh. Um, I, I'm currently taking a class that is oh. taking up a lot of my time. Oh. <laughs> I don't think I can do next week. Oh, okay. But I, I will go through and I'll try and fill out some more of the farther out ones, especially once my class gets out around here. So. How about you, maybe Abdul? Is that correct? Your name? Yeah, yeah. So I don't, I don't know. Um, maybe uh, chapter six. I, I might be a bit tired of next week. But uh, uh, if no one is available, I can still prepare something. Okay, I will do chapter five then. Yeah. So then I'll do six. Yeah. Yeah. And then I guess I can pick up seven. Chapter seven. Yeah. 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 I will do chapter five next yeah. week. Yeah. Thank you. You want me to write your names in? Yeah. 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 Sure, sure. Okay. yeah feel free to do that. Yeah. Sure. Uh, oh. Okay. Sounds good. Okay. So yeah. thank you very much. And then I'll see you guys next week. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Have a good one. Bye, guys. Yeah. Bye bye. Bye. Yep. Yeah.